In this part of the competition, you are taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everybody knows who you are and who they are before you begin. You'll have 25 minutes to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three accounts. During this time, teams will be uninterrupted. When you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for 10 to 15 minutes. During the Q&A, both you and the judges stay in character. After the Q&A, the judges will give you feedback outside the role playing. Good afternoon. My name is Anna, and I'm joined by my fellow consultants, Alana, Assad, and Nick from Polar Collective. We're excited to join you, the Governing Council of the Bank of Canada, to discuss the future of digital currencies in Canada. Cryptocurrency is disrupting the banking industry and shifting power dynamics. Cryptocurrency and stablecoins offer the promise of an anonymous, privacy-protected global currency, free from the oversight of a central power. For the consumer who believes our institutions, such as our banks and government, have too much power, cryptocurrency is an attractive alternative. Only a few years ago, cryptocurrencies were embraced by only a small number of enthusiasts, but we're now seeing mainstream adoption, with 20% of Canadians now owning crypto and 25% considering a future purchase. We've also seen the exponential growth of stablecoin adoption over the past year alone. If this wasn't enough, big tech is showing interest. While Meta's uh, DM project may have been shelved for now, it's not difficult to imagine the immediate impact a Facebook or Amazon coin would have. In addition, the payment landscape is changing. Canadians have always enthusiastically embraced payment modernization, but the pandemic has only accelerated our adoption of contactless payment methods. We are increasingly using mobile e-wallets and sending online transfers. Cash, on the other hand, is considered inconvenient and perceived as unhygienic, and we are seeing a rapid decrease in its use. As the institution responsible for issuing currency, these trends should be noted. The Bank of Canada's mandate is to promote the economic and financial welfare of Canada. The trends we've outlined, the mainstream adoption of private digital currencies and the declining acceptance of cash pose a threat to your ability to manage economic policy, one of your four core functions, and could result in unchecked rates of inflation. Inflation rates have been increasing and currently sit at 5.7%, significantly higher than your target of 2%. While this poses a challenge to most Canadians as prices rise, it's the most vulnerable populations within Canada who would be most affected. For those individuals and families with the lowest levels of income, Basic necessities become priced out of reach, risking increased financial inequality within Canada. We propose that by taking action, the Bank of Canada can proactively mitigate risk, fulfill your mandate, and further meet Sustainable Development Goal 8 in promoting sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth through fostering innovation and expanding access to banking and financial services for all Canadians, particularly the 15% of Canadians currently underserved by the banking industry. In response to these threats, we know that you're conducting research into central bank digital currencies. CBDCs offer a unique value proposition over other forms of digital payments, like cash, they're a direct claim on the central bank and offer instant payment settlement. A high level of transaction data can be communicated with each payment and stored on the ledger. They're also programmable to enable conditional automated payments. Each of these traits carries ethical, legal, and financial implications that must be carefully considered. Central banks around the world are actively looking at CBDC. The models we've highlighted here show that design varies widely to reflect each country's priorities and values. The Bahamas, for instance, has designed their CBDC with both ID verified and anonymous options for greater accessibility and financial inclusion. China's digital one, on the other hand, is ID verified and fully programmable, which offers a level of data richness and control that may pose a challenge for countries such as Canada with higher privacy needs. These models highlight some of the ethical considerations at play. And the key takeaway here for the Bank of Canada is that Canada's priorities and values must be reflected in the design. 
Like central banks around the world, you are actively researching CBDC. You've conducted a pilot project uh, looking into CBDC as a tool for international bank settlements, and you've recently announced a research partnership with MIT. You've asked us to determine your next steps. We'll walk you through the ethical, legal, and business implications of this changing landscape, and we'll present to you our vision for central bank digital currency in Canada. All right, I'd like to take you through the ethical challenges arising the, uh, with the problem we've outlined today. Um, so when it comes to the ethical dilemma faced by the Bank of Canada, we recognize it's twofold and multidimensional in nature, doing nothing as an option and proceeding to operate in our current banking structure would have many risks to losing control over monetary policy. On the other hand, doing something and implementing a CBDC has its own set of ethical challenges if it's designed or implemented incorrectly. So first, it's important to discuss how many Canadians are impacted by the current banking system. We know that financial segregation exists between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. While much of this is due to systemic barriers, it's also largely due to geographic barriers and the availability of services offered. In many rural Indigenous communities, physical access to cash through ATMs or banks is nearly unfeasible, some having over a 100 kilometer travel distance to the nearest ATM. With these challenges, it makes it incredibly difficult for many Indigenous Canadians to establish a good credit score or create a financial retirement plan. Oftentimes, they have to rely on payday loan institutions who do offer loans, but at a significantly higher interest rate. As mentioned, it's estimated that about 15% of Canadians are underbanked. That is, these barriers exist for a significant population of Canadians. So what does this mean for the Bank of Canada? Well, the threat of doing nothing when it comes to CBDC is immense. We know there is inequality present in our current system, but losing monetary policy and the ability to control interest rates only puts our most vulnerable population in greater risk. The Bank of Canada has a real opportunity to ensure that these Canadians are not pushed further out of the banking system, and that is through CBDC. So that brings us to our alternative option, which is do something. So doing something about this dilemma means implementing a CBDC that has been carefully designed and considered. It has many features that can benefit the banking system, but if designed incorrectly, the ethical challenges could be significant and could cause more harm than good. Hence this twofold ethical dilemma. To understand the ethical challenges that can arise from different design options, we must first understand the key characteristics that make a CBDC what it is universal access, data richness, programmability. For universal access, one of the key purposes of CBDC is to create a digital alternative as inclusive as cash. But how can we make sure all Canadians actually do have access? CBDC is also quite data rich as it can be traced and monitored. This is a great benefit to the banking system and beyond. However, who would have access to this data and how protected would Canadians be from security breaches? And lastly, uh, it's programmability. That is, the Bank of Canada could have the ability to stimulate or slow down the economy directly to Canadian accounts. But who would determine the conditions surrounding programmability and how would the privacy and autonomy of Canadians be protected? These are questions that should be explored further. So as I mentioned, there are several different barriers that impede certain individuals from accessing the banking system. You know, geographic, technological, uh, socioeconomic, um, behavioral, a general lack of trust or confidence in the banking system. All of these factors taken, if a CBDC were implemented, it would have to benefit the entire population and minimize the risks of pushing some groups further away from, um, further away from the banking system or creating a bigger divide. Canadian banks have been continuously recognized as some of the safest and soundest across the globe. In fact, 85% of Canadian online bankers feel confident about online and digital banking technologies. Because CBDC offers greater insight to financial information, it can offer huge improvements in transparency and reduce criminal activity. However, there are security concerns regarding data breach, 
government surveillance, and a lack of regulation if implemented incorrectly. Massive threats to security are posed if laws, regulations, and infrastructure are not updated to reflect the unique capabilities of CBDC. A trade-off also exists between um, protecting the privacy of the users while also allowing uh, the capacity to utilize the key features such as programmability of CBDC. While it can improve efficiencies and allow for instant access to stimulate or slow down the economy, uh, there are concerns of who would have access to programming and what kind of safeguards would be in place for Canadians to ensure they have autonomy over their own purchases and that there isn't any government overreach or social control. So that brings us to our four ethical decision criteria when it comes to designing and implementing CBDC. The Bank of Canada cannot lose control over the financial system. Despite barriers, all Canadians have to be provided fair access. It has to be safe, sound, and secure from data breach and government overreach, and spending and purchase decisions have to remain in the hands of Canadians. The first pillar of our recommendation is as follows. Do something. Implement an accessible CBDC with privacy safeguards and regulatory oversight. Now let's look at how the legal and regulatory aspects impact the current situation. A recent survey conducted in three Eurozone economies indicate that this indicate that central banks garner the greatest confidence from respondents for digital currency issuance. Canada's banking system has been ranked the soundest in the world eight consecutive times by the World Economic Forum, and it has the trust of Canadians. The threat posed by cryptocurrencies is not a result of any laws being broken. Existing legal and regulatory framework in the payment sector value security and resiliency, and regulators are slow to adopt new ideas from outside players. But payment technology is evolving rapidly, offering new means of digital payments that are quickly implemented. Cryptocurrencies are capitalizing on this and are gaining adoption by working outside existing regulations. Overall, there is a gap between the pace of technology evolution and regulatory changes. This lack of modernization could impact the Bank of Canada's ability to fulfill its mandate. The Bank of Canada is highly regulated and must operate within the bounds of these regulations. The Bank Act allows only commercial banks and credit unions to hold an account with the Bank of Canada. The Currency Act provides the mandate to design, issue, and distribute physical bills and coins. Finally, Bank of Canada must comply with Privacy Act when collecting and using personal information. Currently, there is no legal precedent limiting the Bank of Canada, what the Bank of Canada may do in response to the threat posed by private digital currencies. Due to the technology being in its nascent stage, emerging global trends may inform Canadian legislation. Let's look at two recent bills introduced in the US Congress to understand the global perspective. The eCash Act proposes a US dollar that users could hold on their phones or smart cards. However, other senators have introduced a bill to prohibit a digital dollar for individuals. There is no consensus yet, and a debate is expected on CBDCs in a Canadian context. No major court cases currently block the introduction of a CBDC in Canada. However, we are seeing a growing distrust of institutions and a growing perception of rights violation. In the aftermath of the Canadian trucker protests, the government of Canada was sued for invoking the Emergency Act, under which Canadian banks froze 6.1 million US dollars, including in crypto wallets. So concerns of government overreach from segments of the population might lead to lawsuits around the CBDC. However, it is important to note that the Bank of Canada cannot issue a digital currency without legislative authorization. Any potential court case hence would target the government and not the Bank of Canada. Based on the analysis of the legal dimension, we recommend that the Bank of Canada work closely with the government to develop a robust legal and regulatory framework to roll out CBDC. 
We're now going to examine the financial and business elements of the current problem. To start, we wanted to remind you of your mandate to improve the economic and financial welfare of Canada. This is done through your four key functions, monetary policy to control inflation, ensuring the safety of the financial system, distributing currency, and supervising the retail payment system. How you conduct business is preventing you from fulfilling your mandate. Your structure is hindering you from reaching customers because the banks are affecting the services provided. For example, commercial banks cater to the affluent. They provide them with better interest rates, more products, and lower fees. For those not working with the banks, check cashing and payday lending has grown to be a $1.5 billion industry. This demonstrates the significant need for broader service. You're reliant on those same financial institutions to provide direct customer service. Bank account administration is a huge undertaking that the Bank of Canada does not have nor want to handle. This role has been very profitable for the commercial banks. The big five have seen 39% revenue growth since 2015. For anything that the Bank of Canada wants to do in the future, the, the commercial banks will need involvement as they will oppose it if they feel that their bottom lines will be threatened. This means continued collaboration is the best path forward for the Bank of Canada. Your corporate culture is amazing for certain things. Stability, trustworthiness, these are critical in the banking industry. However, it's also limiting. Your slow pace of innovation and your agility need to be improved to keep up with the technology evolution we're seeing. Your business culture, if not shifted, will leave you behind. Stability is also a theme of the products that you currently have. You know, $61 million were spent in 2019 on producing banknotes, and yet cash use is declining. These plastic banknotes also pose an environmental concern. The cross-border payments process is slow and risky. Because of the pace of settlement, there's significant currency exchange and credit risks, and additional liquidity requirements, and even time zone issues that arise. In 2016, the Bank of Bangladesh lost nearly a billion dollars because of their systems, and you're also exposed to those same risks. When looking at the current products, there are cost savings, risk reduction, and time efficiency opportunities everywhere. As well, your current communication model comes with risk too. Currently, the main channel is through media outlets and other institutions. Given the current political climate, clear, direct, and transparent communication is needed for building public trust. The control of inflation is helped significantly by setting expectations, and that narrative could be misrepresented with the current existing communication model. The Bank of Canada lacks control and leaves important communication to others. Currently, other financial institutions are responsible for protecting individual accounts. The Bank of Montreal and CIBC were handed a $23 million penalty after a breach in 2018 that leaked personal data on the internet. The Bank of Canada can avoid legal challenge by maintaining their level of access to personal information. The anonymized data that you currently receive is enough to realize your objective. Based on this analysis of the business functions, we recommend that the Bank of Canada play to its strengths and leverage partners in the industry to deliver an innovative digital currency. So to recap, the recommendation we've outlined today is that the Bank of Canada moves forward with a CBDC that is accessible and carefully designed. In addition, ensuring there is adequate legal frameworks and regulation in place prior to its implementation. And lastly, using a collaborative approach to ensure all stakeholders' needs are met. We have identified the three pillars of this recommendation that have actionable steps. Ethically designing CBDC requires ensuring privacy, guaranteeing accessibility, and an outreach campaign to reach Canadians. Enhancing legislation requires updating regulations and having an oversight committee. And collaboration involves the distribution of CBDC, constructing the network, and working together for innovation in the financial sector. Ensuring ethically designing uh, CBDC and putting privacy protections and financial inclusion at the forefront ensures all Canadians have a fair opportunity. The first design feature is to provide both ID verified and anonymous accounts. 
ID verified accounts would have the full benefits of full access digital wallets. These can be used for immediate disaster relief, allowing government to send funds directly to individuals in need and can be used by employers to pay employees immediately, even on a per shift basis. This would eliminate the need to cash a check. Anonymous accounts would use limited digital wallets that would be fully anonymous, but would be restricted, restricted to a $10,000 transaction limit, just like cash. Like cash, anonymous accounts allow users concerned about privacy to conduct transaction, transactions anonymously. In addition to mobile wallets, to ensure improved financial inclusion for Canadians, we would introduce reloadable offline cards, which can store value much like gift cards. We would distribute these uh, through convenience stores, and we would make cards available with no ID requirement. Fully anonymous option, and these can be purchased by everyone, including those who lack government ID or have barriers to accessing banking. And lastly, increasing consumer awareness through financial institutions, media promotion, and advertisements. Messages about low-cost transactions, privacy, and payment efficiency will be crucial for adoption. The unique nature of CBDC payments dictate a need to establish strong governance and create guide rails for operation. To build a foundation for CBDC to succeed in Canada, existing legislation must be updated. Additionally, an oversight committee comprised of the CBDC system participants should be established. For the Bank of Canada to legally issue a CBDC, three existing national legislations must be amended. The Bank Act must be amended to broaden membership to include fintechs. Currency Act must be amended to provide Bank of Canada with the legislative authority to issue CBDC. Due to the data-rich nature of CBDC payments, Privacy Act must be amended to incorporate a robust privacy management program. The creation of a CBDC oversight committee will ensure all stakeholder interests are considered while prioritizing innovation and accountability. This oversight committee will own the CBDC network in Canada and will be governed by its members. The primary members will be the Bank of Canada, the Department of Finance, financial institutions, fintechs, and other payment service providers. The key responsibilities of members will be to define regulations for the CBDC network and provide transparency through monitoring and reporting. Introducing a CBDC also comes with technical challenges and the Bank of Canada will leverage its partnerships to provide distribution, build and operate the payment network, and to provide additional customer serving innovations this will ensure a financial industry that can evolve to, to, to serve future needs. A CBDC will be a claim on the Bank of Canada, but accounts will be, pro be provided by existing partners. Financial institutions have existing relationships with customers, and they will continue to work with them. This keeps the banks happy, but moves the Bank of Canada closer to the end customer. The network built will erase personal information then provide the Bank of Canada with the needed transaction data without additional security risks. To build this new payment network and transaction ledger, the Bank of Canada will define the design and regulations first. That process will inform partners of the requirements and allow them to bid on the network development. The selected partner would then build and manage the network with oversight from the CBDC committee. This plays to each party's strengths and will lead to an efficient rollout. FinTech involvement will unlock the most exciting and unique opportunities of a CBDC. The possibilities of incorporating new data to revolutionize payments are endless. With advanced mobile wallets, parents can restrict purchases to trusted stores so their kids are always safe with their money. Conditional payments help small businesses so they can unlock opportunities that normally need high credit ratings. FinTechs will identify and solve market needs well into the future, given this new payment platform. When totaling the project budget, the Bank of Canada will bear most of the costs, but meaningful investments will be provided by partners to enhance the payment system for consumers. This project is expected to roll out over five years, which means an annual investment of $20 million. This is right in line with past payment innovation investments, so the, the cost is quite reasonable. 
The impacts of implementing a CBDC are wide ranging. We'll examine these from an economic, social, and financial perspective. From an economic standpoint, CBDCs provide you with a powerful tool to manage monetary policy, ensure the stability of the financial system, support innovation, increase environmental sustainability, and revolutionize payment efficiencies. A CBDC also expands access to banking and financial services for all Canadians by enabling instant government relief checks and instant direct delivery of paychecks with low fee accounts and offline access, a CBDC can remove, excuse me, remove economic and geographic barriers to those currently underserved by the banking system. We anticipate financial inclusion rates rising from 85 to 93%. Finally, a CBDC will generate benefits for all stakeholders, but it's specifically worth noting that a CBDC would generate annual savings for the Bank of Canada of 30 to $40 million. In conclusion, we recommend implementing an accessible CBDC with privacy safeguards and regulatory oversight through collaboration with government and industry. In doing so, as the Bank of Canada, you can fulfill your mandate to ensure the economic and financial well-being of Canada and meet UN Sustainable Development Goal 8 to ensure sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth for all Canadians. Thank you. We'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate, uh, appreciate all the information you just shared with us. Um, one thing I'd like to just maybe have you circle back to and give and, and dive in a little bit deeper, or maybe clarify for me a little bit better is, you know, how, how do you describe in maybe a little bit more detail, you know, why the privacy and security issue is an ethical issue? Like what is the ethics or what is the harm that you're trying to solve for with respect to privacy and security? Thanks for that uh, question. Kendra, I, I think we're, we're ultimately looking at this in terms of protecting the rights of Canadians and ensuring that um, Canadians aren't harmed. Um, as we know, a, breach, a data breach could cause significant hardship to individuals. Um, and so that really does pose an ethical dilemma, just ensuring that um, parties uh, don't know more than they should about individuals and that and that rights are respected. Thank you, Anna. Um, why don't does any any other of the um, the panel of judges like to ask the next question? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. You guys gave the, uh, the very good view of the ecosystem of what's sort of being created here. Um, so I had a few questions and this could touch up about three of them. Um, so as far as um, looking at the finances of it, annually, say, does the savings about 30 to 40 million, but with the cost of about 20 million, is that um, from year one to year five of your rollout, or do you see that kind of changing or the numbers being different year per year? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. Thank you, Michael, for that. Um, so the $20 million, um, it would take about five years to roll it out. And then once it's rolled out, we'd start seeing the savings. Um, so it, it would it would transition over time um, to get to that level of of uh, you know savings for the government because what we would need is the adoption um, to ramp up and so we expect that to happen in, in you know about five years after um, after we initially roll it out so as consumers are become aware and transition to using this new currency uh, that's when the savings will come in because. It'll increase the efficiency of the Bank of Canada and they'll have to, um, you know, physical currency will, will be less in demand. And so that's where a lot of the key savings are from. Thank you. Thank you. And my, my first couple of questions is based on kind of the numbers, uh, looking at the overall reach. Um, but then looking at kind of like that sleeping giant Bitcoin, which is very, basically viewed as like a great savings asset, which is competing with everybody, but kind of in the background and yet in the forefront. How do you, do you see that being any issue for us that we have to deal with? Thanks, Michael. I, I, I think I can start uh, us off on, on that answer. Um, absolutely, Bitcoin um, is, a, is a very large presence and, and should be uh, 
you know, regarded carefully. Um, however, the, uh, we can see that there's volatility there with, with prices. And so in terms of using Bitcoin as a, as a currency, um, you know, we, we see that there's room uh, for an alternative for something that is more stable. So I think from the Bank of Canada's perspective, uh, stable coins and perhaps emerging stable coins that might come from big tech may pose an even larger challenge. Thank you, thank you. And uh, last question, and I'll turn it over to the next judge, um, to the next uh, member of, of the corporation here. Um, looking at other countries, I see I see what you're planning for Canada, right? And, and I, I see, like, again, the ecosystem looks, looks good as far as how to protect fellow Canadians. I'm looking at other countries, so looking south, whether it's the States or looking over in Europe and various uh, other countries. If they're not being as responsible or if they're doing something that could, could conflict with what you're pro proposing here, how could this system deal with that? Because again, if Canadians adopting this, maybe if they see how the United States is handling it, they may say, hey, I'm still gonna stay in other cryptos or it may not be responsibly handled as far as um, interacting with each other. So how would this system interact with a potential corrupt system is, is the question. That's, that's an incredibly good question. I think, um, absolutely perception of what's going on is uh, really, you know, around the world is really critical to the success of this initiative being uh, or within Canada. I think there's, uh, you know, in particular, uh, we can look to, you know, models that are the model that's been rolled out in China, and we can see that certainly um, there may be concerns among certain segments of the population and maybe even the population more broadly. Um, so I, I think being aware of how things are being implemented is absolutely critical. I think communication with stakeholders throughout the entire process is absolutely critical to managing perception and ensuring that we make it clear to Canadians um, exactly the, the benefits of, of this program and how it's being, being rolled out. Thank you, that answers my question, thank you. Barbara, do you have any questions? And then also we have Amy who did join us a little bit late, but she also is a, another judge on our panel. Hi everybody. Well, I'm gonna say what an interesting presentation. Um, easy to follow and your graphics absolutely were, were really very, very good. Um, it's good to know that the, you, you say that um, you know, Canada that were underbanked to such an extent, you said you're, that, um, and considering the expanse of the geography and, you know, potential internet issues with, you know, getting to all of Canada and the great geography. So one of my questions is, you know, there, there's gotta be some kind of skepticism with getting into this as we've noticed from you know, the states and others getting into, you know, the new forms of currency. So how do you plan to mitigate, you know, um, users' apprehension and enhance consumer buy-in? Thank you, Barbara, for the question. Um, I think, you know, one thing that the Bank of Canada really has um, on its side prior to this design and implementation is, the amount of trust that Canadians have in our banking system. You know, it's, it's a very trusted system. Um, you know, overall Canadians trust the system, but on top of that, we're really gonna rely heavily on those campaigns to educate Canadians and to reach out to them directly and let them know that this isn't any different than any other, you know, um, uh, money that they've used in Canada before. We're still taking the necessary steps to make sure that, you know, it is private, it is secure, they are protected, and that's, you know, the Bank of Canada's number one priority. So relying heavily on those campaigns. Thank you. Amy, do you have a question for the team? I do. I have a sort of a two-part question. Um, again, thank you for your presentation. Um, I apologize for being slightly late. Um, but I think these two questions go together. Um, I'm wondering, would, would individual banks volunteer to participate in this new currency once created, or, or would it be mandated and required at some point? What do you envision, you know, 
as far as that rollout. And, and along with that, um, it, it's a very enormous task to start with and, and would take significant investment both by uh, Bank of Canada, but also again, the individual banks and even individual businesses who would all be needing to update their uh, technology and systems, accounting systems. Um, you know, I guess, was that something that you either considered or how do you foresee that um, rolling out or maybe also being, would, would we support would we, would we be contributing money towards those changes as well? Thank you, Amy. Maybe I can answer the first part of that question. So um, in Canada, the Bank of Canada and the existing commercial banks and credit unions have a history of close collaboration. We have seen that with past payment modernization efforts that the banks and the payment service providers and the Bank of Canada have worked collaboratively together. So we, uh, for the CBDC, we envision the same, the Bank of Canada working closely with the banks to design uh, a CBDC that works for Canadians. So um, I don't think it, it is, uh, we don't envision it to be forced down the banks where they don't have a choice. It would be more of a collaborative approach to the CBDC development. Yeah, and, and and just to build on that, what we're what we're excited about for this opportunity is the potential competition between um, the fintechs and the existing banks um, to you know offer services that really enhance the payment networks. Um, you know, in in Canada right now, a lot of businesses are still writing checks, right? And one of the reasons for that is the memo line. They like to put what you know, what invoice is related to, or things like that, in that memo line. If you can have a payment system that is, you know, been developed by these fintechs that go, hey, this, you know, we're going to send you 20 payments, and these are exactly what it's for, and you have all of that clarity and that transparency, and it's recorded, and you can go back and refer to that. There's huge benefits for businesses, and so really, we think that. Yes, there, there probably will be some you know, costs for transitioning over to it, but we're, we think that everyone's gonna be really excited by the potential for some of these innovations to help their businesses long-term. I have one more question that I'd like to address. I mean, what do you see as the biggest obstacles or risks with this implementation? Thanks, Kendra. Um, I think that was touched on um, you know, with, with one of the questions uh, earlier. I think uh, the biggest risk to this plan um, would really be the buy-in of the uh, major financial institutions. In, in Canada, we refer to the big five. Um, they hold considerable power. Um, however, we do, as we've discussed, we do envision uh, that this would be a highly collaborative approach. Uh, the Bank of Canada, as you know, uh, works very closely with the, the big five. Uh, there's a close relationship. And uh, they would be there would be stakeholder consult all the way through the process. Uh, so this uh, risk, while significant, we feel would be mitigated through consultation. And what about the legislative process? That um, who, would, who would the uh, opponents to that type of legislation likely be? Thank you, I think that's a great question. Um, would one of my teammates like to jump in? Sure, yeah, no, it's it's, interesting that you that you raise that who would be in in opposition and i think that's where again that sort of education piece would come into it um because we know right now the political landscape is very polarized and so you know you could you could have someone saying these outlandish things about what it's going to do um especially with you know what we're seeing from the uh you know the the chinese one the digital one and they're saying, okay, you know, it's government control and it's, um, you know, it's all of these things that our CBDC in Canada wouldn't be. Um, and so that would be potentially where the opposition would come from, would be from a misunderstanding. Um, and so that's where it's really important, again, to start the dialogue now and have people understand what this is and show them the benefits of what it's actually going to do for them. And, and that's really, you know, concrete examples. And like Alana mentioned, you know, that outreach of going, okay, here's how you use this. Here's how the benefits are gonna, you, you know, really help make a difference to you in your life. 
Thank you. Well, I think our time is up for q and A. I I think we'd like to switch hats from being the Bank of Canada to being ourselves and give you some feedback on the presentation. Um, I'm happy to kick that off for Michael, um, Amy, Barbara, if you'd like to start. Uh, I'll jump in. Uh, first off, a great, great, great presentation. Um, the um, speaking in different sections. So looking at the actual presentation, how you see you were able to seam up what we view and what we hear, your, your timing, everything was excellent. So I was really, really um, impressed by that. I noticed that in between slides, it just, just went. The speakers were just almost like one continuous conversation. So you guys have a very, very tight presentation. So, you know, I'll pat yourself in the back for that. Well, well executed. So congrats on that. Um, as far as picking a topic, you guys picked a hot one. You know, I mean, this the financial the situation is changing. And so this is, um, this is right on cue. So it, um, it, it sounds like a financial conversation and you could have easily had it be such, but you're looking at a very deep thing as far as people's access to their money. You know, and then that's sparked how many wars throughout history. So you picked a really hot topic. I liked how you presented it. Um, first presentation, you know, you're, you're good. Just keep it up. Um, looking at everything else, I nothing strikes out to me at this moment as far as um, a big issue. I think you guys have a very tight presentation. So if you can get other feedback, incorporate it, make it even better. Thank you. Yeah, I would uh, echo Michael's comments. I think you guys did a great job. Um, really incredibly on point incredible you know really did a good job i think of following the instructions of what it, it of what we were looking for at, at each stage so i think you guys really knocked it out of the park on that point um i think one thing that if you you know for some feedback that might help you in your next presentation spend a little bit more time helping us understand who we are and who the bank of canada is you know we have here bank of america which is just a retail bank um, so helping the Americans understand, I think at the very outset, what the Bank of Canada is and what our role is, because are we the board of directors, you know, are we management, like who are we, and I think that might help engage our, our mindset in terms of how we ask some of the questions and making sure we're, we're thinking about who we are throughout the conversation. Um, but again, I think you guys really, really did a good job in, in staying on, on topic and, and hitting the relevant points that this whole, uh, this whole competition is about. You know, if, if I can add my my bit, wow, you guys were on point. Your slide transitions were smooth. It was easy to hear each and every one of you. You were clear, you were crisp. I would say for a digital presentation, you certainly checked off all those boxes. What came to me and, and I certainly agree with, with the comments that my colleagues have made. You know, equity is such a big, important item right now, especially, you know, financial equity, digital equity. And considering how large Canada is in so many islands and areas where only Lord knows how one gets there or the kind of infrastructure there is roadways as well as you know digital and and things like that so i would say personally i would like to hear more about that because as, as we grow as a global economy as canada continues to grow having people who can participate in the system is is to me very very important um and and something else that i would like to and it'll also help with your your buy-in and your sell through because adoption is really important you said there's like a five-year window there are other items and other products that might happen between now and then and so i would i would also that also how did you test your, your concept so that might be something that's one of the questions that i wrote down on my sheet was well, okay, this sounds feasible, but has the concept been tested? You know, what's something similar to it that you could pull as a parallel? So that those are my comments. I think you guys should all pat yourselves on the back. Again, I think you guys did a great job. Um, I think um, you really laid it out, you know, and it was really hard for me in some ways to come up with questions that really, you know, that were able to really look at some weaknesses because I think you guys really did a good job but again I think sometimes when if we 
when we're presenting things, you know, it is good to maybe go into a little bit more detail on the risks and the downsides because it was presented in such a positive way that I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's rare that anything um, executes um, easily or on schedule or perfectly. So maybe touch on some of the potential, more on potential risks and downsides and what happens if we do nothing, what have happened, you know, some other alternative scenarios, um, just a little, maybe just an idea for a little bit of more flavor to it. But again, I think you guys just did a great job. Okay, and, and Amy just posted something in the chat. Her question was what other programs would we be pulling from? Yeah, pulling funds from, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just because it is such an enormous amount of money. So it's obviously a, a big shift if, if we're not already doing this. I'm just kind of curious what what would be suffering or what you know what what other programs or plans are in place that we might be pivoting from? Amy, that's a, a really great question. Um, Nick, I, I see that you unmuted. Did you want to uh, tackle that? Yeah, well, it's actually an interesting time for the retail payments landscape in Canada right now. So um, just in the past year, they've kind of redone the interbank um, financial um, transaction system. And so that was a system that was like over 20 years old. Um, and that was purely for the high value transactions. And what's next is that their current, you know, low value uh, system for tra uh, transactions between people's accounts, that was first introduced in 1984. Um, so we know that that is potentially coming. And our uh, thought would be to, you know, instead of ded dedicating money to kind of revamp something that is going to go out of date already, let's put that put those funds uh, towards uh, this new system that's going to solve way more issues than simply just an update of kind of an existing architecture. Um, and so what we've seen um, for those dollars that, that have been spent, it's about the same as what they just spent um, to redo that high value transfer system between the banks. And so we know that, you know, that number, while it does seem intimidating, is about what they've been spending already. Thank you. So um, just three things I'd like to say as uh, director of the Institute for Business Ethics and Sustainability and hosting the competition. First, I want to welcome you because it's wonderful to have you and your university participating. Uh, one compliment that I haven't heard said yet is you handled the question so wonderfully by always affirming the question. That's a really good question. You're, you're, the way in which you affirmed uh, was really uh, masterful, I thought. I just want to speak to tomorrow, so you have that feedback related to, to that. Uh, the 10-minute presentation tomorrow will not use PowerPoint. It will only focus on the ethical dimension of what's being presented. And as I heard your presentation, I thought of two buckets uh, of ethics. One is kind of the compliance and regulatory and care for you know, privacy and some of these kinds of things, critical, very important. One, one dimension. Another dimension is your advocacy for banking access and real um, economic um, opportunity, especially for the disadvantaged. And that is a, 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 an aspiration of service and access. And so um, you were so good in the way in which you laid it out in your PowerPoint about those dimensions. Um, if you can take the feedback that you receive from the judges and some of the things that they identified, that's the kind of thing that you will want to um, focus on and flesh out as you prepare your ethics presentation tomorrow. 